as far as I can remember, that I had a good time when I was around 14, 15. We had a lot of ball games up here, a lot of dances, and they used to look for a king and queen around February. And king and queen would dance, they had a step dance. Everybody step dance. And that's where they pick them. And the king and queen was Leo, Paul and Katie. They were queen and king around here. There was a lot of people around. They used to make baskets, flowers. My land sack used to make wooden flowers. Handles, pig handles. What about the language when you were younger here? How was it used? There was quite a people using their big map around here. And a lot of people was talking with old people. And when they start dying off, start losing it. They sing in Indian, mad. Somebody dies, they sing in big Mac. That sounds good. Eagle Tommy Governor should be. Ball game, bro. I come up, go DJ. We'll worry the king or queen, or I'm up, go DJ, go all evening. Good time. And king or queen, Leo or Katie. And when they're. I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And what's the way I got it, Jeff? I don't know, what's the way I got it? Dick Paul, okay. Okay. Louis Paul, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Churchy took the bag of you. 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 That's it for me. My name is Isaac Barnaby, and I was born on the reserve here, up, the, up there by the ball field, where the ball field is. That's where I was. There was no house in there, my grandparents, and I, that's where I was born at in there. Can you share a little bit about how the language was used when you were young? Yes, there were. We, we had the Indian language. But it's the idea we learned, we had to learn the white language. You had to learn it. And you got to, you went, everywhere you went, they talked, they were white. They, I mean, the English was English. And a few of us Indians, you know, the few, the few of us, when we were alone, and my grandparents and everybody, they all talk Indian. That school up there we had, they had to, learn us and tell us, you got to talk white. You got to be, it's a white language. You don't talk Indian. You can talk Indian when you go home. That's what those sisters told us. Mm -hmm. When you go home, you can talk, but in this building there, you got to talk English and you got to learn how to talk, you know, you got to stay, use language. Indian. And the Indians, us Indians, we, we we all get together after that we still keep a, keep keep our language going, but now you, it's hard to find a person to talk Indian. People, Indian people now, no. So can you still understand it if somebody's yeah. speaking it to yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, I can, I understand it. And do you speak it at all? No, no. no. But I, but it, but I would lay sometimes I'll you know. Depends on who I'm talking to. If there's something going, something going wrong or something going, I can, I remember it. And so, what's on his head? That's his, that's his, that's our Indian, in Indian custom. You know the feathers and everything. Mm -hmm. That's an old one. That came from down, Almasdale. Mm -hmm. 
country, the when they were living down there, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah, these are all the boys. And that tree there, this, this is that tree there, that's up by the graveyard. Oh, okay. That was there a long, long time. Back in those days, every all everybody was one. We were any everything we had, we shared with everybody. And if something something ain't going, we take care of it. We all helped each other. And very seldom anybody they, they, that we asked for help or something. Same with we had our own way, our own our own way of religion. That was the inside of you. That wasn't that wasn't what we got now. Mm -hmm. What we got now is it it it's, it ain't it ain't like it used to be. When and when we were when small when everybody was small, they shared everything. And if if anybody got was sick, they all everybody went to their house and and helped them, and helped them all the way through. Who would make the like quill well, work? You would. Yeah. Would you go out and gather everything? Yeah, we gather. Oh. We get. We used to go and and get it and bring it home. And, and that's a that was a family thing. All the the elderly women. That was their thing, making those all different things, and they talked, and they all talked, and it, it and that was it, you know. And after the, after you do so much, and then you take it and you see see if you can sell it. They said no, and and for that, you you buy groceries. We were poor, all this we were, yeah. What little we had. That was it. No, we we, we did we didn't have a whole lot of stuff. But what's on the table? You ate it. And, and what about baskets? Who oh, was the big basket makers up here? A lot of them. Yeah, was lot it of something them. everybody did? Yeah, that was one thing that everybody did. Yeah, and you could. They know what kind of what size trees to do to the big baskets, but it did well, let that tree grow up. To a certain, and then they'll cut it down, and and, and they will grow some more. And they, and that's how. Then they take those baskets, make them, and go go to go anywhere, and sell them, sell them to a lot of places. Yeah, but I miss it though. Yeah, nowadays, very few people talk Indian. Very few. My name is Jim Maloney. Nina Dela was a saga, a sibadagadic widget's kitchen a week. Well, there was a nanny gay gisco gis, ingo, a gitchka, delivistin, ulnuik duk. Clame in a miss kissy mother desk at Milky Das na. My dad was a warrior, delivistin, and a ekiano, and he fought across the big waters, and he was brave. This is the area that we were brought up in. Shubanagadi or Sibanagadik, as we call it, the, the nut, the land of the wild nut. It was, uh, originally our people lived along the Shubanagadik River, and uh, eventually, through the Indian Act, they brought them up here. Get over the mool down the meg and gum the monk wedgie up. Get over the mool saag away, ul nuwuk tuk, a gum and a muggy dead dis gong go away, a get along for this don't go away del the talking to you a little bit in Mi'kmaq in my old ancient language also, so you'll understand uh, and respect of uh, what I have to say to you today. The language was very, very important. When we were growing up, very, very simple things like language was, was everything to us. Um, we didn't have a lot of issues. We had no electricity, no running water, and, um, very, very little food. Uh, your keepsakes were the best thing you were noted for in those days were your working tools. We were noted for the axe, the Megan. We had a, we had a de Megan and uh, my, my dad had a pole axe. Now that would be something you would think today that wouldn't mean anything, but a pole axe them days was like having a Cadillac. We had, that axe went from generation to generation to generation. They would say, Ekian or Steve's, Steve's got the pole axe, go and borrow his axe. Or his axe is always sharp. 
Then we had other people like the Williams that had sauce, and they were very famous. Max, um, they were very famous at uh, sharpening uh, the, the sauce. Charlie Williams, very famous fiddle player, very famous reputation of sharpening sauce, and the Martins uh, from the Meadows, very famous of sharpening sauce. So the tools were very, very important in the old days. And the old people, all they spoke was Mi'kmaq. All I heard in my household was Mi'kmaq. My mother and my father both spoke uh, Mi'kmaq fluently. My mother, Mary, oh, Mary was a uh, medicine woman, daughter of the famous uh, Dr. Frank Cope, uh, the medicine man who sent his medicines all over the world. So it's very interesting that you're doing this documentary on the language and the tra traditions and the customs of, uh, of our people here. And the language is, is something that would be very difficult for me to think uh, in, in Mi'kmaq. Every thought that I have to think is in English. This is a sad part that has been taken away from our people. We no longer think or our thoughts cannot be in Mi'kmaq. Our dreams cannot be in Mi'kmaq. Our ambitions cannot be in Mi'kmaq. We're, we've been assimilated and forced to think English. Even your thoughts were a crime. You were, you, even your way of dreaming was a crime. They wanted to eliminate that whole process from our body, from our mind, so we would be completely assimilated into the English language. Well, Mom was going to school. She was a single mother at the time. So I was raised with my grandparents, um, Noel and Rita Michael, here in uh, Sabinganagadi, or Indian Brook it was called, so known as. And they were basket makers. And they had a lot of kids at the house, a lot of their grandkids, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of us boys. And um, I remember my grandfather, who was originally from Eskasoni, would speak Mi'kmaq to us. And my gram, who was from the mainland, spoke Mi'kmaq. And, you know, like little command words like Jugue, come here, and Ajimpa, go to sleep, and one of my favorites, Due, get out. <laughs> but we would always speak to each other. And then there was another family down the road, uh, it was Becky Julian and Flash actually, their, their kids. We would go to the bus stop and we could understand each other, we would say a few words to each other. And getting on that bus, I remember going to the Shibi school off the reserve, and that's when I noticed there was a something different about us. So after that we just sort of um, got accustomed to learning more English and those words sort of left us. I was talking to a tiny criminal from Waikagama, Waikagama, and he was telling us at a teacher's conference, he said, a lot of the language was lost as soon as the plugs went in the wall. And I was like, electricity, okay. Of course there's a you know, residential school but when I started thinking about the electrical part, I said, yeah, we heard more English in the households. I know that, you know, in the 40s and 50s and early 60s. And it started going down. Uh, I wasn't around then, but I know this. <laughs> um, and so what I want to do is I've been sort of using the Internet as a tool to turn it around, to use the electrical, the electricity, and teach the language, not just to this community, but to the entire nation, Mi'kmaq Nation, even that's not just in Canada or the States, there are Mi'kmaq people around the world I'm getting, getting notices from and emails and messages saying, thank you Kurt for doing what you do, um, I've never heard it in a while or I've never heard it. So I'm trying to use it to our advantage. When we were kids, there was only a few of us that could speak Mi'kmaq, okay? When I was around 10 years old, you know, the upper elementary level, everything was in English. You know, our parents spoke English, our aunties and uncles, our cousins. And when I got in junior high, um, I, unfortunately, both of my grandparents had died. And it was really hard. So I thought to myself, how am I going to speak to my grand granddaddy when I go up there and see him? I should learn the language. So I started asking friends and family from Eskasoni, where my other grandparents are from. And um, what I started doing was, in high school, I started writing Mi'kmaq words phonetically typing them out on an old typewriter and just teaching my friends at the high school in Hans East. And after a while I noticed after I printed them all out I had a book this big, <laughs> this thick. 
and it was all phonetics, so you know, it, anyone could read it. And that's where it sort of sparked, say, hey, I'm doing what I like doing. I like teaching Mi'kmaq, what I know, because I'm just a marginal speaker. I'm learning every day from Becky Julian down there. And she's a great teacher. She's a walking, talking Mi'kmaq dictionary, right there. Right? So I went to the elders, and actually we worked together. So she came to me too. We met at the school. Best thing that happened in my life. And now, when I look at our kids, our, when I say our kids, I mean our students at the school, grade primary to grade six, they're talking Mi'kmaq to each other in the hallways, in class. And if I see somebody walking down the hall, Kwe Mr. Michael Meda Wilain. And I'll say, Oh, Wile, do a skadigil. Mu Wile, yo. You know, I'm not doing too good. And then I'll say, Oh, the lad again. Because they know the conversational part. They, could, they wouldn't have a problem. They're just practicing their conversational skills. And it's really heartwarming to see that. You go to a store or wherever, a community function, I have a lot of parents saying, hey Kurt, what, what are my kids saying? And that's, that sort of hit me right there. I said, okay, I'm going to show them what their kids are learning. So I started recording myself and posting videos on Facebook <laughs> using that electric, the electricity to our advantage. And it's pretty cool because like parent-teacher meetings, they want to know what their child is learning and I'll tell them what their child is learning through a video. That way it reaches every parent. Because uh, I know probably 99% of the parents have Facebook. And I, I see that when they press like or they message me. So we've come a long way within the last 20 years or so. I've been working as a Mi'kmaq language teacher for around 10 years or, or longer. I was always at the school, at the new, the new school. And that's, um, I don't give homework. I don't give tests because I don't want to create anxiety. I like, I like them coming to class and having fun. We do a lot of stories, drumming, dancing, and visual stuff and physical stuff. And it's really neat because they're, they're more involved. So that's what I like to do. That's how I want to be taught. I went to Cape Breton one time and I saw, I think it was my, one of my cousins talking to her, her daughter. And she was using body language. Stuff like this. And I say, that's, I'm learning this. I'm watching a mummy and child. All right, I'm going to be the parent to every student down there I'm teaching Mi'kmaq. And I started doing this. And I find it way more effective because our people didn't sit in the classroom and learn their language. They spoke it.